All right, so as I said, welcome everybody to the webinar today, Solar Maximum Observing Challenge. Um, I'm going to put the link bank in the chat. There it is. Um, that is a one-stop shop for all of the resources that we will be covering today. Um, so don't feel like you have to write everything down or take screenshots. If you just save that link there, it has links to all of the resources we'll be covering today. All right, so just a quick introduction of the facilitators. Uh, my name is Claire Ratcliffe Adams. I am an education associate at the Space Science Institute. Um, we are a nonprofit organization located in Boulder, Colorado, um, although we have researchers all around the world um, working as part of the Space Science Institute. I am in the education wing. Um, it's called the National Center for Interactive Learning, where we lead an initiative called the Star Library Network. Um, so I know today on this call, we have a mix of folks. We have some librarians from our Star Library Network, which is a network of over 7,000 libraries across the country and territories. Um, but we also invited astronomers, um, astronomy students. Um, so whatever your background is today, just welcome and thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'm joined here today by Aaron Clevenson from the Astronomical League. Um, he's going to introduce himself a little bit more later, um, but we're really excited to have his expertise um, and uh, his insights into this observing challenge that you and your community um, can be a part of. So what we're doing today, we're going to just start off with a quick icebreaker. Um, Aaron is then going to give an overview of the Astronomical League and the Solar Maximum Observing Challenge. I will be giving a little demonstration of how to build a DIY soda bottle magnetometer um, that is a way for you to collect data, make uh, predictions based off of that data, um, and really try to, to yeah, experience solar maximum using a very simple and cheap tool that you can build at your home. Um, we will then have a discussion about incorporating the challenge in library programs. Um, so those of you who aren't working in libraries, I would still love to hear your thoughts on how you might participate in the observing challenge. Maybe you could connect up with a library um, to do an outreach program, but we'll have a little discussion about your ideas based off of the resources we present today. Then Aaron will give a, some additional free astronomy resources um, and we'll end with a Q&A. Um, at any point though, please use the chat. You can ask questions, um, make comments. You can also use the Q&A function if you have a question and we're going too fast and you don't wanna lose it. All of those functions work um, and we'll be sure to do our best to answer every question that you have. All right, so here's my icebreaker. If you are a librarian, you may have seen this icebreaker before, uh, but today's a new day, so maybe you feel differently. So my question to you, and you can answer in the chat, what solar feature do you feel like today? So are you a sunspot, you know, relatively cool, calm and collecting, but embracing change and transition? Are you a solar prominence, showy and bright, but feeling grounded and connected? You're not, you know, leaving the sun. You're just, you're feeling good and grounded and showy and confident. Are you a coronal mass ejection? You are powerful. You're influential. You are ready to, you know, mess things up. Or are you feeling like this? Uh, sun's corona, gassy and sassy, and you won't let anybody's shadow dim your light. So go ahead and answer in the chat. Um, I think today I'm feeling like a solar prominence. I'm feeling hyped up for this webinar, um, but I'm feeling, you know, pretty grounded after working with a magnetometer all morning. You know, I'm feeling, I'm feeling that groundedness. <laughs> all right. So we have a lot of answers coming in. And just once again, just a reminder, be sure to address your chats to everyone, not just the default. So we have a mix of all of them, really. Marianne is saying solar prominence. Yeah, that's how I'm feeling today. Uh, we've got a number of sunspots, you know, feeling kind of cool, calm, and collected today. Let's see. Well, I see a lot of ones. A lot yeah, we of don't seem to have picked up any coronas. There's no sassy and gassy folks today. Interesting. All right. You guys haven't drank as much coffee maybe as, as I have. All right. Here's one. We've got we've got at least one Corona. There we go. <laughs> yes. Yes, Denise. Don't let anybody's shadow dim your light. Awesome. 
Fantastic. I do want to also say at the end of this presentation, you will have access to these slides and you're welcome to use them if you're doing an outreach program or a library program and you like this uh, icebreaker, uh, you will have access to all of the slides as well as the recording and the chat transcript um, when, the, when the webinar is over. Awesome. Well, thank you for participating in that. We'll go ahead and move on. And I'm going to turn it over to Erin um, to talk about the Astronomical League and this uh, really cool challenge. Okay, thanks, Claire. Hello, everybody. Uh, good to be with you all uh, today. And I think we've got a really exciting uh, thing to propose and to try to get you all involved with. Uh, so, Claire, if you would hit the slide. Thank you. So I want to say a little bit about me. Some of you may know me, but a lot of you probably are wondering, who is this guy? So uh, I'm the Observing Program Director with the Astronomical League. I'm one of five, actually. Uh, we are people who work with the Astronomical League. We'll talk about that in a minute. And help drive our program. So we work with all the coordinators that we have. I'm also the director of the Inspirity Observatory. That's here in Humble, Texas. Uh, it is Humble because there is nothing humble in Texas. Uh, so it is pronounced humble. And uh, I'm also a retired astronomy professor. I did that for 18 years at a local college here called Lone Star College. I'm a member of the North Houston Astronomy Club. That's uh, where I do my local stuff, a lot of my observing when I'm not at the observatory. And I'm also a retired computer engineer. So I really eat up all the computer stuff that's related to all this. So if you have any questions along the way that fits into any of that, just uh, let me know. Okay, Claire, next, please. So let me mention just briefly about the Astronomical League. So we too are a nonprofit organization. Uh, we're a collection of over 23,000 amateur and professional astronomers, uh, over 300 different astronomy clubs. And our big thing is promoting, observing, and also astronomical learning. We're very big in the learning department there. So we have over 65 observing programs that members can participate in, and it's everything from a lunar program to the solar programs. We've got a whole bunch of stuff for all kinds of deep space objects. So a little something for anybody. So if any of you are astronomy enthusiasts and want to know more, that's something you should check out and the link will be available. Uh, but that might be for you. And then the last thing, and what we are actually here to do today, is we have observing challenges in the Astronomical League. And they usually are short time span. Uh, the ones we currently have are a little bit more open-ended, but normally they're very short time spans. But they're available to everybody. You don't have to be a member. They're free. They usually have certificates. Uh, and this, of course, is one of those. So we'll talk about that. Okay, next, Claire. So we do have two types of observing challenges. One of them are we call Ast Astronomical League Observing Challenges. And those are ones that focus on celestial objects, very specific to something out there in space. So it may be, in this case, related to the sun, or more specifically, in this case, related to the solar wind. Uh, and then we have NASA observing challenges, which tend to focus on NASA missions. So there's usually some spacecraft of some kind involved. But again, the purpose of this one is we want to focus on the solar wind itself and charged particles and things like that coming from the sun see how that affects and interacts with the Earth's magnetic field, and we're going to use a homemade magnetometer to see if we can actually detect it. So, Claire? So, a little bit about the sun. So, I don't know how much any of you know about the sun, so I'm going to go back to the basics. And my idea is I want to make sure you're empowered and have the knowledge that you need to, when you go out and explain this to other people or share it with your patrons at the library or people that show up for um, star parties, things like that, you've got what you need if you don't already know it. So the sun is a star, like any other star. So when you look up at night and you see all those bright little specks in the sky, those are somebody else's suns. Well, we don't know for sure there's anybody actually looking at them as a sun, but the sun's the exact same thing. So in the case of our sun, it's not too small. It's not too big. It's kind of in the middle of the road. Most stars are actually much smaller than the sun and very few are actually bigger. But in the case of our star, the sun, every 11 years, it goes through a sunspot cycle. And there's lots of stuff going on inside the sun, but from what we can see, the most obvious thing going on is we reach a peak in our sunspot activity. 
And we're there right now. We are at that peak. Uh, if you look at this chart down here at the bottom, the red is projected. And of course, this is back from like 2022. So uh, it doesn't have the most current data, but I also couldn't find the most current data when I was looking for it. But the blue line is what has actually happened. And if you think about what's happening right now, if you look out there where it says 2025, because we're almost to 2025, and you go up to that next gray bar above that one, right there, that's where that blue line is right now. So we are at a really, really strong maximum, which is very exciting because there's things to see. If you have a chance to see it through a solar telescope, it's a wonderful thing. And with our magnetometers, we should be able to detect the motion and movement in the Earth's magnetic field as a result of those sunspots up there. So we have more activity during a maximum, more sunspots. The solar wind is stronger. So the sun shoots something we call the solar wind. And what they're sending at us are charged particles. They come off the sun. And we get a lot of those when we have something called a coronal mass ejection. And the way to think of that is it's actually shooting a piece of the sun out into space. And sometimes they come our way. And sometimes they're fairly devastating. Uh, they can call po cause power outages. They can damage and shut down spacecraft. And if you happen to be an astronaut up in space, probably they're going to want you to go shelter in a very safe, secluded place, like in the space station, where you'll be safer from all those charged particles because they're not good for humans either. Okay, next one. So a little bit more about the sun. Again, some more general information. So light travels very, very fast, but it's not instantaneous. I mean, people like to think, well, you know, I turn the light on, it's immediately bright. Well, yes, but that's because you're actually fairly close to that light. So if you think about it, the sun is about eight minutes away for light. So light traveling at the speed of light leaves the sun, it comes zooming out towards the earth, and eight minutes later, we get to see it. So it's actually eight minutes and 20 seconds, just to be exact. It also emits charged particles, as I mentioned, and there's lots more of that going on during these solar maximums. So we're there now. I mentioned the coronal mass ejections. And the thing about these charged particles is they travel slower than light. They're you know physical things, they're, they have mass, so they can't travel at the speed of light. And so they have to travel slower. And so in their case, it takes anywhere from two and a half to about seven days to reach the Earth. Well, the exciting thing there is if we're watching, uh, either with a solar telescope, perhaps in my observatory, or if you're watching, if you're NASA and you're watching with your spacecraft that you have out there keeping an eye on the sun, the minute you see it and send a message to Earth saying, hey, it's happening, you still have two and a half to seven days to prepare before it's going to get here. And that's important for people who have satellites in space because you want to put them in safe mode uh, while that's going to hit. But it also means we can prepare for it. So we know that if we, if or if they see, we see something on the face of the sun, we know in two and a half to seven days, we're likely to see something on our magnetometer, which is kind of exciting. So... In addition to messing with the magnetic field, which is hard to see, it also causes the aurora borealis, or if you're in the southern hemisphere, the aurora australis. It's the same thing as the northern or southern lights, and they're amazing, and they have been amazing this year. Um, I live in Texas near Houston, and I've been here for 30 years, and this is only the second time in those 30 years that aurora were visible from Houston. So that kind of tells you how big a deal this really is. Okay, so, and we're going to try to detect those changes to the magnetic field. Okay, next. So we have an observing challenge, and these links will be in this presentation, which you can get later, but it's also in the, uh, the little list of links that Claire has provided you with. So again, you don't have to take notes on that because you'll be able to get those. But basically, we have AL Observing Challenge Special Observing Awards. That's a mouthful. And the one that we're currently in is the opportunity to build a magnetometer. I'm going to skip the next one and come back to it because we need to talk about that in more detail. And if you want to participate, so anybody can build a magnetometer and anybody can do all of the cool stuff and see the effects of this solar maximum on our 
magnetic field here on Earth. But if you want to participate, get a certificate at the end. You do have to do 50 observations. You can do as many as two per day. You can start at any time. So as soon as you have a magnetometer at your disposal, you could start tomorrow. And you have to finish, again, if you're going to participate, by March 31st. So you have plenty of time. That's, what is that, five months or something? So just, you know, lots of time. And uh, you can do two a day. So in theory, you could do it in 25 days. Okay, so I want to encourage you all to do that. Take advantage of that. Put my coordinator to work who has to send out all those certificates. Uh, we do send them out electronically, at least. Um, but the piece that I skipped, you want to make sure you put it somewhere where it's not going to be disturbed. And we'll repeat some of these key points as we go and you know, as we're building the magnetometers. But you want to make sure nothing is going to mess with it. And we've seen all kinds of things cause problems. So, And we'll talk about some of those later, too. But specifically, if you're using a laser, which we will recommend, or if you're using a white light. The white light is much less critical, but if you're using a laser, it's really important that that laser, the bottle, and the target are in the exact same position and same place throughout your whole experiment. Again, if you're planning on submitting. If you're just doing it for fun, then that's not the big deal because you just get to see it move anyway. But it moves slowly, so it's going to move from hour to hour, perhaps day to day. So it's kind of nice to have that standard setup where you can actually go back and say, oh, OK, it did move from yesterday or the day before. OK, and then the last statement there is if you are going to participate, we said you have to do your observations by the end of March. But by the end of April next year, you have to have submitted it. And you can submit it to our coordinator electronically, so it's actually pretty easy to do. Um, but that gives you time to mess with your data and see if you can actually see the things that are supposed to be happening. And we'll talk about those as we go. OK, next, Claire. <clears throat> OK, it changed and I didn't notice it. My, sorry about that. I kind of spaced out there. Um, OK, so what is an observation? And we've got an example of one of the ones that I did. But the idea is you want to record the information that lets you look at stuff from NASA. I use that term very loosely. And you want to compare that to what you're seeing. So my recommendation is, this is general. I would do it once a day. And the reason for that is then you have these once a day. And if you need to go back and look and compare data, you can do that. So what you're going to do is you're going to set it up. And we haven't talked about exactly how that works. But you have a yardstick. And on that yardstick, there are numbers or a meter stick. And those are going to tell you where the sun's spot, well, let's try that again. The laser spot is going to be based on what the sun is doing to the Earth's magnetic field. And so if you think about a compass, a compass always points to magnetic north. The problem is when you mess with the magnetic field of the Earth, you're actually messing with where north is, or at least the direction that north is. So uh, again, you'll set that up. You want to note where the spot is. After you've done that, then we have a website that I'm recommending. There are other alternatives, but this is all there and in one place, so it's easy to get to. It's called spaceweather, one word, dot com. And if you go out there, there are three things that you want to get a copy of. And I just you know, basically cut and paste these. So the first one is up near the top on the left-hand side of that website is a picture of the sun. Looks very much like the one we have here. Claire, could you point out it for me, please? Yeah, that one right there. So it's actually got the numbers for the sunspots. Uh, do we care about the numbers? No, not really. But that's how they keep track of them as they move across the face of the sun as the sun actually rotates. So you want to get one of those. The second one over there to the right is the auroral projection. And this changes all the time. So depending on what time of day you do this, you may get a completely different picture than you will an hour or two later. But it's a projection. That's the only one of the three that you can't replicate the data in the future. So if you miss that one, it's not as critical. But if you miss that one, it's tough. The sun, that image of the sun and all those sunspots, there's an archive, and you can go back and get one from any time that's in the archive, so plenty of them. The third thing you want to get is a copy of the Planetary K index chart. That's over there on the left. And I picked a very exciting one. You know, A lot of them are little green bars for the whole thing. It's two and a half days worth of data. So if you miss this one day, you can always go back and get the previous day. 
And if you, I know you can't read it, but if you look at that very last column, the orange one in that uh, chart, if you were to do an observation at that moment, you don't know what the K index is because they haven't put it up there yet. It's a three hour average. So if you get one of these every day, you can always go tomorrow and see, well, what was it when I actually did the observation? So kind of important. Again, I think daily is what I tried to do. Actually, I did it twice a day, but it's just convenient. Okay, and then there are two things you wanna do. So first off, you wanna see if your data, your numbers as they change along that uh, measuring stick are changing along with this graph. So as the K index goes up, you should see more deviation in the magnetic field, which is what you're measuring. That's the first one. The second one is, we know it takes two and a half to seven days for the charged particles to get here from the sun after the sunspot erupts. And so what we wanna do is we wanna look back two and a half to seven days and see if there were sunspots in a position where it's likely that they're gonna send material toward us that got here today. So again, that's the advantage of having the extra, you know, doing it daily and keeping all of those is you can go back and look. Okay, let's go on to the next one. So this is a sample observation. The thing in white is actually one of my observations. Um, so what do you need to record? Well, you wanna record the date and the time. And of course, time is not that critical. So I recorded uh, hours and minutes. Uh, I record my times as four numbers and I leave the colon out. But uh, so that first one up there at the top was 10, 18 in the morning. And, you know, it's a 24 hour clock. So if it's afternoon, they'll be above 12. Uh, so date and time, very important. You wanna record your reading. So you, up there at the top, you see it says measurement 13. That was my measurement that day. 13 is my standard, not much happening on the sun number. So this was a quiet day. And if you look down there at that K index, you see, yeah, there's not much happening. We're in the green, which is the lowest possible levels. And they're way down there. I think those are twos, if I remember correctly. Maybe ones. At any rate, not much going on on the sun uh, and its effect on our magnetic field. Then you want to capture the aurora forecast. Again, that's the one on the right. And the K index chart as well. So that's what you want to capture. The format's not real critical. Uh, do whatever works best for you. Um, I, I like, again, I'm a computer engineer. I like to do things on the computer, so I just stuff everything into a document. Okay, next, please. All right, this is kind of odd in the middle of this, and you may wonder, why on earth is this here, and why is it yellow? Well, it's yellow because if you get a copy of this PowerPoint in its natural state, this is actually an image that you can copy out of the PowerPoint. And the image is on yellow because I wanna make sure it's clear. I know the background on that image is not yellow. So if it works here, then it'll work if you use it. And Claire, if I can get you to back up one slide again, please. Oh, I didn't do it on this one. All right. So typically what I do is if you look at that sun, I superimpose or I drop that grid right there on top of the sun. And that tells me how far from the center of the sun, at least from our perspective, a sunspot is. So if I know it's going to take, let's say, two and a half days, two and a half days would be, okay, go on to the next one again, if you would, Claire. Two and a half days would be over there where it says minus 30. So if it were at minus 30, it's going to hit us today. If it is at zero on a chart, then it would have already hit us. And by the time it gets here, you know, it moves 30 degrees in two and a half days. That's how fast the sun spins. So for me, it helped with that prediction part is I can put this on because I can't estimate where minus 15 or minus 30 degrees is. That's just much easier. Okay, next slide, please. So you'll have that, you can use it. So what do you need? I'm not gonna spend much time here because Claire is gonna go into this in great detail, but you need a two liter soda, soda bottle and or a pop bottle depending on what part of the country you're from and i have a recommendation and i do not own stock i recommend using a coca-cola bottle and the reason for that is the shape a regular soda bottle that most people use has very vertical sides and that's great and it'll work 
but we'll show you a trick that you can do with a Coca-Cola bottle, which just it makes it so much more convenient. Uh, so sander pebbles for ballast. I used small pebbles. You do need a lightweight mirror, a small magnet. If you're doing it from scratch, and we'll give you some shortcuts there too, but you need a drinking straw, some thread, an index card, and a yardstick or a meter stick, whichever one works best for you. Uh, something you can use as a target, a flat white uh, piece of wall works really well if you have a white wall. <clears throat> and you need a light source. And again, we're biased. Uh, I think we're going to suggest using a very inexpensive, not very powerful red laser. Uh, like one you might use for a presentation that you're going to give. Uh, the green lasers, those some of you, I know at least some of the astronomers out there might have green lasers. They're way too powerful and way too bright. You actually want just a tiny little red dot. Okay, next one, please, Claire. And this is what it looks like. Again, I'm going to spend even less time on this one. Uh, so go ahead on to the next one. That was kind of a little teaser there. And does this mean it's back to you at this point, Claire? Yes. Okay, because oh, as I say, this is, it didn't have my background. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so I will take it from here. Um, I do want to go back really quickly um, just because the image here, um, Aaron set it up a lot better. Uh, just just to note, I'll just note it a couple times because it is really important if you're using a laser pointer, it has to be at the same spot every time you're taking your measurements. So if you're taking it away to do like, I was just using a clicker, uh, like a presentation clicker, say you have to use this for work for a presentation, um, you wanna make sure you're putting it right back in the same spot. Um, so I really like how in this image, you can see there's a structure um, pointing, at, you know, you know exactly where to put it. Um, so make sure you're marking it in some way. The picture I used, I did not mark it in any way because um, I was just doing one for today in a public area. So I was going to be moving it, uh, but just that's really important to note. Um, so yeah, so let's talk through the materials. Um, this is really cheap, uh, really easy. You probably have most of this in your house or your library. Um, so a clear it does have to be clear, so you can't use like Mountain Dew bottle. Um, a clear plastic two liter soda bottle with a lid, keep that lid. Uh, remove the label, sewing thread, a bar magnet that needs to be shorter than the width of the bottle, a small craft mirror, you know, maybe an inch, um, um, or a sequin works. I actually used a sequin today and it worked really well. Um, a three by five index card, or even just a some sort of card stock that you can cut um, and that will fit in that bottle. Sand or rice or something heavy to put at the bottom of the bottle to keep it from falling over. Um, this next one is optional, reusable adhesive, such as blue tack or, you know, poster putty. Um, that is just if you need it to help balance your card hanging. I did not need to use it today. Aaron, we talked about it yesterday, said he's never had to use it. Um, but if you're having trouble getting your card to balance, that is a good tool to just add a little bit of extra weight. Um, you want that bar magnet to be horizontal. Um, a drinking straw or copper wire, that's two different ways to attach um, your uh, magnet to the card. And I'll show you both um, how it worked for me. Um, and then tape, scissors, and super glue. And super glue is important. Um, if you're using the straw, don't use a hot glue gun. It will just melt the straw <laughs> as I tried last night as I was practicing. Um, and then just like regular Elmer's glue wasn't working for me because my bar magnet was so heavy. So super glue is important. So I just need to jump in here. We have some resources of where you can get some of these supplies if you need them. We'll talk about it a little bit later. And of course, you'll have it. But uh, okay. Yeah, Aaron put some recommendations and that is in the link bank um, for places you can buy the mirror and as, as well as the ma uh, magnet. So the first thing you wanna do is here's, this was my Diet Coke bottle on Aaron's recommendation. So you can kind of see that little shape there. Um, and Aaron, jump in at any point because this was my first time making a magnetometer um, and Aaron is very experienced. So if I did anything incorrectly, feel free to call me out. Well, um, well, let me jump in here and make a suggestion. So if you look at the one on the left, she's got a ring around that bottle that she's she's drawn. 
Uh, I used a permanent marker when I did mine. And the easiest way to get that, because you want it to look kind of nice, right? So the easiest way to do that is stack up some books, rest your permanent marker on them at the right height, and then you can just spin the bottle in front of it, and it'll draw that line at the same height all the way around. It's just a wonderful way to get that to work. And so... Yes, and that is what I did, and I really appreciated that tip because I cannot draw or cut in a straight line, um, and it's making that template for cutting it. So, um, you know, cut the um, top or bottom third of the bottle. You'll see in the instructions that are linked in the link bank, it says to cut off the top. Erin um, did recommend the bottom just to, with this shape, it's easier to, you know, find that spot. That's a third of the bottle. Um, but yeah, you can talk more about Aaron, why you recommend actually cutting off the bottom instead of the okay, top. Okay, so so I don't know if you did this in your example, but uh, let me just describe what you're doing. So you're cutting the bottle on the thinnest part. And somehow you're going to have to connect the bottle back together again. And so there's a whole bunch of ways you could do this. Uh, tape is not the best adhesive for things. It's what you want to use, but it's not the best. So when you put it back together, you're going to be using, I used scotch tape, you know, something like that. And, you know, it was wonderful, but I wanted something that was a little more sturdy. So what I did was not only did I make the cut indicated by that brown line, but I made another cut about an inch higher on the bottle. So now magically my bottle is shorter than it should be, but that's okay. And what that does is the second cut is at a point in the bottle where it's wide enough that when I match the two pieces back together, the bottom piece actually fits inside the top piece. And so I just thought that was a lot stronger connection. Mm -hmm. So anyway, so I recommend that too. For sure. Um, you can do this. You can cut off the top part and then reattach it up there. Um, so just when you look at the activity guide, it's okay to do both ways. The activity guide has the model at the top. Um, and then you want to fill the bottom, regardless of if you cut at the top or the bottom, fill the bottom third of the bottle with sand or rice or pebbles, something to keep it sturdy so that it can't fall over. Or, you know, if you, someone opens a door, it'll get blown off. Um, it just is going to kind of anchor your magnetometer. So then you want to prepare to hang the bar magnet. Um, so there's two different ways you can do this. You can use a drinking straw. So on the left here, I cut a piece of straw a little bit less than the width of the magnet. And I use tape, honestly. I was trying to use glue. It was I was having trouble. So I just used a piece of scotch tape and just wrapped it around it. Um, or if you want to get fancy um, and you have, maybe you have patrons at your library that are really crafty, um, you can wrap that bar magnet in copper wire. Um, it was a lot easier to do the straw than the wire, um, but just for me, but that might, you know, you know your patrons best, you know, you might have a jewelry wiring program and, and those are the, you know, you want to get those artsy kids into doing science, just a couple different ways that you can mount um, the, the magnet. Right. We actually have a third way we're going to share with you in a little bit. Yeah, if you're really into high tech and want to do a 3D <laughs> printer version, um, Aaron will offer that to you as well. So next you want to glue the magnet to the top edge of the index card. And I'll show a picture of what mine looked like in a minute. Um, then you're going to attach a, the sequin or the mirror to the middle of the other side of the magnet. Um, in this image, they did it at the top. You can see the mirror is attached right at that top of that index card. Um, Aaron recommended uh, putting it at the bottom actually. So that's what I did. So you'll see in the next slide, um, just a different variation that you can do um, for, for the mirror. Um, and then finally, just to keep in mind, the magnet must hang horizontally. So you really want it to hang horizontally right here. Um, and this is where if it's, if it's tilting or something, you may wanna use a small piece of poster putty, you know, on your card just to, to rebalance it if necessary. Yeah, I would say that a little differently. The mirror must hang perfectly. Well, in this case, it would be vertical. But, you know, it, it needs to be perfectly vertical because you don't want it at an angle. If you've got an angle going on, then it's going to reflect the light off in some odd direction. Thank you, Aaron. 
So hopefully I did it right. You'll see this is my next thing. So I have my, um, I use the straw. So again, it just felt a little more sturdy to me than my my copper wire because I'm not a wire wrapper. But it was really fun to make. Um, so I have my straw here. It's taped to my magnet. Um, and I just thread used use the sewing thread to thread through there. I tied a little knot and that's going to hang from the top of the bottle. And so I use super glue um, to glue this magnet onto the top of the of my index card here. And then I glued my mirror on the other side um, down below. Um, instead of up here, I did it a little bit lower just so um, when you are getting the reflection of the laser off of the mirror, um, it was just easier for me to, to line everything up correctly when it was like that. Right. My thinking for that is it puts weight at the bottom of the card, which tends to cause the card to hang vertically. And mm -hmm. so you get that vertical mirror that you need. The other thing I'll mention, sorry, Claire, because I, I no, have not seen please, this previously. No, please, go ahead. Um, you don't need the whole three by five file card. You could cut it in half and use only half of it. Because remember, you're going to be inside your Coke bottle and you don't want to touch the bottom. You don't want to touch the sides. So the fact that this is only three inches wide, it won't touch the sides, but you also want to make sure you stay away from the, the ballast at the bottom. Absolutely. And this was actually, the card I found is a little bit smaller than three by five. Um, so you'll see soon how it fits into the bottle itself. All right. So after you, you know, prepared your magnet, um, you want to make a small hole in the center of the bottle cap. Uh, because that is what you're going to be threading that thread through. Um, and it's important that you use this because that will keep it centered. Um, if you just hang it in and tape the side of the thread to the bottle, it'll be off kilter. So putting a hole in the center of the bottle cap um, and threading that thread through is really important. I used a um, thumbtack to make the bottle um, to make the first hole. And then I did use a, my little exacto knife just to make it a little bit bigger. So it was easy to thread my sewing thread through. So just some tips, um, for how I made that hole oh. in the bottle cap. And I'll, I'll share with you how I did mine. I'm a little bit more, I don't know what the right word is. Um, uh, less couth. That's a good word. Uh, <laughs> I actually went out to my garage, got myself a, my smallest Phillips screwdriver, put the cap on the workbench and basically ram the screwdriver down through the middle of the cap. And it was the perfect size, so. Nice. Yeah, I was actually looking, work. I was looking for a little nail and a hammer and our toolbox was missing. So I was like, I wonder if a, a thumbtack will work and it, it worked really well. Um, you are then gonna feed the thread and the mirror sequin through the hole. Um, that sounds really weird. You're basically just gonna take your, your thing that you created uh, I literally took this, these instructions from the um, activity guide. So I'm glad we're doing a webinar to kind of explain it. So um, you just take your, your contraption that you've made, you're going to thread it through that hole that you've created um, and secure it uh, to the bottle top and then tape. Uh, the last thing you're going to do is just tape the, because you, right now you have, your bottle is in two pieces. Um, the final thing that you're going to do uh, is tape your two pieces of the bottle together. Yeah, I've so, got a, a little tidbit, oh, which yes, is there. No, go to the next slide. It's perfect. If you look at the one on the left, if you take the bottle cap off the bottle, so you can get the thread through the bottle easily, right? It's a one inch or so hole. That's pretty big. But when you want to get it through that cap, you've now got this tiny little hole you need to get it through. So if you take it off the bottle, it makes it just much easier to get the thread through it. Yeah, okay. that is definitely what I did. Um, and yeah, there you can see everything's glued together. The thread is going up through the hole. Um, once you- Wait, wait, I, I do have to say one more thing. Of course. Don't do it like she did it here. You have to oh. thread the thread through the bottle first and then through the cap. Because yeah, if you do I, it like I did the one that, on the left, I, it won't work. I did that so. next. Yeah, I did this for the <laughs> picture and then I had to take the cap off because you have to, uh, there's no way I can get, you know, my car yeah, through that hole <laughs> through that hole that's not going to work so yes I did I did this mainly for the picture but um once you have it attached um you want to make sure you are 
attaching the string to the side of the bottle. Um, Aaron had a really great tip um, as a way to ensure that you can readjust it in the future um, for any reason um, to do two pieces of tape. So the first one you're gonna do is just this, this one coming down here and I taped it and then I looped the string up and made a second tape there. So that way I'm saving some of that tail just in case for whatever reason, I need to lower it, raise it, make sure it's it maybe, you know, in this picture, it looks pretty off kilter there. You know, you wanna make some adjustments. Um, this way you're not just taping the, the string, cutting off the tail. Um, and then, you know, it will, will be harder to adjust. But here is it all together um, with, I did use uh, packing tape to tape it back together. Um, but as Aaron mentioned earlier, um, use that like divot in the, um, in the Coke bottle where you can actually just slide it, you know, the, the narrower side um, into the wider side and then tape it and it makes it a little more sturdy than just taping two edges together. You can see so, there's one of my attempts with my laser pointer right there. Yeah, you missed the you missed the. I missed mirror. it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what I wanted to comment here was because I know this happened to Claire and it has also happened to me. It also happened to somebody at my observatory during a workshop. Uh, once you do this, do not hold the bottle up by the cap, and the reason for that is no matter how good you think you did it, that tape that's holding the two pieces together is going to let loose and it'll dump your sand or gravel all over the floor. Yes, good tip. Aaron literally told me that yesterday when we were doing our run through. And I was like, yeah, of course, that's just common sense. And then today I was coming back to my office holding all the items and I was holding it by the top. And sure enough, the bottom uh, fell off and I had a pile of sand in my office hallway. So I learned from experience. Sometimes you have to like hear it and then learn from experience, but now you're hearing it from both of us. So hopefully that won't happen to you. All right, so then you have your magnetometer um, and I'm sure Aaron, please comment on my arrangement. I was just doing this as a very temporary spot. This is not where it's gonna be forever. Um, I just wanted to get a picture. Um, there's a couple things to point out about this diagram, which is in the activity guide. Um, the angle where your this lamp is your laser pointer or a white light um, to the mat, uh, to the mirror should be closer to 10 degrees. This degree is, is way too wide. Um, so the activity guide suggests anywhere between 10 to 20 degrees of angle for your light source um, to the mirror. Um, so you wanna kind of narrow that. And then um, your scale, which I used a yardstick that I just secured to a whiteboard, um, should be a anywhere between one to two meters from your magnetometer. Um, so just, just a comment on this isn't quite to scale um, and it will take some trial and error, I think, to really figure out the right spot. Also, like I said, this is not, this laser pointer, um, I love what Aaron did about uh, in, in his diagram, having some sort of physical spot or, you know, you need to make sure that laser pointer is always uh, taking, uh, you're always pointing it um, in the very same location. Um, hopefully that made sense. Yeah, so a, a couple of key points here. So in the diagram on the left, the angle is misleading. That's much bigger than it should be. And on the other end, the minimum you want is 10 degrees uh, from center. And the reason for that is your light's gonna come in and if you're at 10 degrees off, it's gonna bounce back and it'll be 10 degrees the other side of where it's hitting the mirror. So it's not true center, right? Because light reflects at the same angle it comes in at. So, okay, so 10 degrees should get you pretty much anything that the sun's going to throw at the Earth's magnetic field, and you'll be able to see it. If you go less than 10, you may end up shooting the light right back at your laser, which that'll mess up your numbers. All right, and so the light uh, will bounce off of that mirror on to your uh, metric, your measuring device. Um, and that is what that is that number that you're going to be recording. And you're going to be uh, try to record it, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, Aaron, but within the closest half of a centimeter. Um, and you're well, going to watch say... that change over time um, as the as the 
your magnetometer, your magnet is going to adjust when there is uh, disturbances to our Earth's magnetic field. It is right. really fun. I told Aaron, I got really excited walking because I was, I was going around my office trying to find different spots and the magnet always was facing the same way, no matter what direction I was going, where I was going. It was, it was very cool to, to see that in practice after you make a DIY like compass of sorts. So. Okay. So in, in relation, you want to be as accurate as you can on the numbers, because the more accurate you are, the more likely you're going to see a change. So if I were using your setup here, with a spot that size on that yardstick, I would say that is, if I can get the units right, 16 and 7 eighths of an inch. And I would be that precise because if you get small fluctuations, it may only move a quarter of an inch. Mm. But it all depends on how you set it up. And we'll talk about that in a little bit too. But uh, you, you can control how much that moves. Um, and it's two functions. It depends on how close your target is to your mirror. Um, and that's kind of the, the key thing that you need to think about. The other thing I'll mention right here. So if you look at this laser spot, it's a tiny little spot because laser light doesn't diffuse very quickly. And so it starts very tiny. And even after it goes, you know, 10 feet, 15 feet, however long you have to shoot yours, no matter what it is, it's still going to be a fairly small spot. If you do what the direction suggests, which is a white light, that will work, but my recommendation is you want the mirror or sequin, if you're using a sequin, to be very small because the white light coming at it is already diffused. So it's going to hit it, but the reflection you get, I think in my case, it was close to six times the size of the mirror. And so if I have a one inch mirror, which is what I use, that means my spot was six inches across. And I don't know where the middle of that is on my yardstick. So that was why I went with a laser. I just said, oh, it's much smaller, easier. All right. So Aaron, that is all I had for building the magnetometer. Um, but before we move on to the discussion, is there anything else you would like to add or um, reiterate? Yeah, I'm trying to think. No, I think that pretty much covers it. Some more stuff may come up as we go, but I think we're good. Great. Well, that is how to build a magnetometer. It took me about 45 minutes. Um, uh, and just a safety thing, if you are doing programs with younger kids, preschoolers, this might not be the best activity for them. Those little bar magnets are small and um, you don't want a kid to swallow a magnet. Um, that's that's very bad. Uh, I was going to take this home and do it at home, but I have a three-year-old at home and I decided to, to leave it at the office. So just a safety note, um, you want to be sure um, you're doing this with the correct audience. With that being said, um, I would like to turn it back over to you all um, for this discussion. Um, how do you see incorporating the Solar Maximum Observing Challenge in your library program? Um, so think about it. You can answer in the chat. Um, a couple ideas I had while creating this and going through the um, creating my magnetometer and reading through Aaron's uh, challenge was you are a place that can just promote this challenge, share this information with your community, um, because as Aaron has mentioned, you need to keep this magnetometer in one spot. It needs to be a stable spot. The table I used out there was not ideal, but like a heavy wooden stable table um, that won't get disturbed and won't get knocked over. Um, so some of you, your libraries have a place like that. Some might not. So this could just be something where you share this information on your social media and, um, you can be available to answer questions. Another idea okay, I had was, oh, go ahead, Erin. Yeah. I was going to say, let me jump in here just for a second. Cause I just noticed something out there in the chat that I want to say something just before we get too far away from the Hi. magnetometer itself. So James asked, does it matter which way the magnet points? So the magnet, when you put it out there, is going to point north and south, which means the mirror is going to be facing either east or west. So I know this may be a little bit confusing, but that's all right. So it's going to be perpendicular is what matters there. So um, you've got your magnet, the mirror is on the side here, so it's pointing east or west. It doesn't matter which way the magnet's pointing, north will always point to north. So if you put the magnet in, I'm using this term very loosely, backwards, instead of pointing east, your mirror is going to point west. 
And actually in my observatory, I have one of each because I did exactly that. I wasn't paying attention. I just put that magnet in, glued it all together. And I said, oh, this is not good. <laughs> so um, so it's not real critical. Uh, it just means you orient everything the opposite way on your working space. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention, and because I meant to mention it earlier and I forgot, uh, Lori mentioned out here that she has already done this and has one. And it brought to mind two things. One, which Claire just discussed, which is make sure it's on a very hard, solid, uh, not likely to vibrate a whole lot surface. So if you put it on a flimsy card table, as an example, uh, every time you walk by, if you're on a wooden floor, it's going to bounce, which means your mirror is going to bounce and sway and no nightmare. So you do want it somewhere solid. She put hers in on her basement floor, which is concrete. Uh, the ones at the observatory are on a very heavy optical workbench sitting on concrete. So, you know, I consider that to be very, very stable. The other thing she mentioned, though, was one of her readings, or at least when she started, was near a sump pump. So I got a quick story to tell you on that as well. Uh, at the observatory, we have a sliding roof and it's steel, heavy steel. And uh, when I started, I wasn't paying attention to what position the roof was in. And my data was all over the place. You know, the magnetic field wasn't changing, but it just kept changing. So I actually did an experiment where I messed with the roof and I said, all right, right now, what happens if I move the roof? And the readings I got was with the roof closed was 13, which is, again, my center point. With the roof open only two feet, which actually put the edge of the roof right over my laser. Uh, when I did that, I got a five. And when I opened the roof all the way, I was getting a seven or an eight. So yes, large metal objects have a significant impact on it. Uh, I had one observer tell me every time the garbage truck went by out front picking up garbage, the magnetometer moved. So keep those things in mind too. Um, most of you probably aren't under a steel roof, or at least not a heavy steel roof. But uh, anyway, so that could be an issue as well. Okay, now I'll be quiet again. Let's let's carry on with the questions. No, that's great. And people are already active in the chat. Um, awesome. And we have a question. Are you suggesting that this would be more of a community measurement reading project versus hosting a program on how to make your own magnetometer reading and doing your own readings. Really, these are just ideas and I think different libraries can have the have capacity to do for different things. So like one idea is you could invite families in, build magnetometers, have the have all the materials and share information about this challenge and then have them go home and they can collect data at their own home. And so you're just a space to share the information, have a, you know, a sciencey craft project um, and then you're not actually collecting data. Or if you have a space um, and you want to do this, you want to get that certificate, um, you can find a spot in your library where it will be, um, you know, stable, un undisturbed, and collect that data. Maybe you can invite, uh, if you do a weekly STEM program, invite those kids once a week or however often you um, come in to, to, you know, collect that data um, or your teen advisory board. We did want to point out if you're doing the challenge, um, you can always do that just, you know, for the sake of doing science. But if you want to be, um, if you want to submit this to the challenge, you will need to um, collect data more often than just once a week. Yeah, we don't have time for you to do it once a week. Twice a <laughs> week, I think we'd get you there, but once won't. Uh, the other thing I would mention is any of your patrons that come to one of your sessions that build a magnetometer and would like to are also all eligible for the observing challenge. It's not just you guys, but it's everybody. So Awesome. Well, yeah, I just want you to start thinking about, you know, next steps, you know, what are you, what might you do with this information? Um, and in the interest of time, I am going to move on just because Aaron has some more resources for you all to, uh, to be aware of. Okay, I need to mention one more thing. So Lori, this is for you in particular, but for anybody else who might notice it, there are two things. The observing challenge is 50 observations up to two a day but there's an observing program out there, which is for members, 
which is a hundred observations. So Lori, you and I can talk about that later uh, to eliminate any confusion there. So three quick resources. Um, the first one is me, so I feel completely good about that one. The other two, I'm not trying to sell anything, but if you are looking, these are the ones that go with the first one. So like I said, I'm a computer engineer. I happen to have a 3D printer, and I imagine some of you also have access to 3D printers. I have an STL file for a 3D printer that makes that cute little red device there, which is a mirror holder. And uh, let me go ahead and just very quickly uh, share one of my screens. So yes, I'm gonna interrupt yours and I'm gonna turn this on. Come on, there we go. So this is it uh, in my modeling tool. And you'll notice there's a circle there, it's slightly raised so you can put a mirror in there and it's designed for a one inch mirror. And in addition to that, it's got this piece at the top, which I'm having problems getting it to flip the way I wanna go, there we go which you can imagine your mirror would be in this part, not mirror, your magnet would be in here. And it's got this little archway that you can shove the thread through so that you can use this in place of that piece of cardboard. And the reason I did this is I wasn't really happy with the first one I built, which had a cardboard card in it. So um, one of the things that I'm offering, and I'm gonna stop sharing just so we can go back to the presentation. Um, could you pop the presentation back up, please, mm -hmm. Claire? Um, so if you would like to make one of these because you have access to a 3D printer, uh, that's my email address. I don't mind emails. So send me an email and I will go ahead and uh, send you the plans. It's an STL file and then you just plug it into your printer and it should print it. However, it's assuming you have a magnet that fits and a mirror that fits. So if you're going with a tiny mirror, like you want to use a white light, so you want to use the smallest mirror you can or a sequin, you can just glue it to the middle of that circle. I mean, none of that's really critical. Um, and so you don't need to get these mirrors. These are one inch mirrors. Uh, I just ordered mine off of Amazon. Uh, so something like that would work really well. My magnets look like this one at the bottom. It is marked south and north. North will point to the North Pole if it's floating freely. And uh, again, the only reason I mentioned these is these are what that 3D printer model is designed for. So if you're adept at using your 3D printer software, you should be able to take this in the STL file and modify it to meet whatever magnet and mirror you may have. Uh, but I just like this. It's, it's wonderful. It hangs in the middle of the bottle and it just it's really convenient. OK, so that's that. I do have a few more resources I want to recommend and I'm almost out of time. So if you have people that are 10 years old or younger, we have an opportunity. It's an actual observing program, but it's open and available to everybody free. Uh, it's called Sky Puppies. It's an intro to astronomy and space. Uh, we will provide a free workbook or manual depending on the situation. Uh, it does come with a certificate and a pin. Uh, and again, it's all free. So again, contact me if you're interested. Uh, that's from the Astronomical League. Uh, the second one is also available from the Astronomical League, but it's actually from me directly, which is when I was teaching at the college, I wrote an astronomy textbook for my students. And I did not do it to make money. I would actually give it to them free electronically. I'm offering it to you free electronically if you'd like a copy of it. Uh, it's out there on the Astronomical League website, and it's a full-blown textbook. Um, if you think astronomy, they're typically 23 chapters. I used a different approach. I don't have 23 chapters. I have 191 components, um, but I put them in very bite-sized pieces. So it is over 500 pages long, but it's an intro level course. It's designed for high school or community college. So you don't have to be a science whiz to be able to understand what's going on. So both of those are available. Both of those are free. Uh, like I said, you'll have this link elsewhere, but if you, know, you have any questions or problems or want to talk to me about anything, you've now got my email as well. Okay, that's it for me, Claire. All right, well, that is it for our presentation, right on time. Um, thank you so much, Erin. Thank you so much, uh, everyone, for joining. I'm gonna check the chat for any questions. Um, and I'll stick around, you know, a couple more minutes if anyone has questions, comments. Um, I really appreciate those of you who have done this before and adding tips and tricks. It's always, it, you know, 
so good to get that experience. So awesome. Yay. And Thank just for all. clarification, only uh, I think I probably explained it okay. The PIN is only part of an observing program. So Lori's question about, you know, the PIN may require membership. It's completely separate. Anybody can do the observing challenge. And that's the 50 observations, no more than two per day. Yes, thank you for that clarification. Awesome. Well, this recording will be available on the StarNet webinars archive page. Um, I'm going to go in and add that to the link bank that you had. Um, so the same link that you have, if I make updates or add anything, just use that same link. Um, I think I need to, I realized I needed to add the downloadable um, astronomy for mere mortals. I'm really excited to, <laughs> to check that out myself. Um, and uh, the let so Tish, you asked, can we find the entire lesson online? The link to the DIY soda bottle uh, magnetometer is on that link bank. And that has instruction, step-by-step -step instructions and how to collect the data as well. Um, so if you, so that is, if that's what you're asking for, it is um, linked in that link bank. And I'll put that link one more time in the chat here. So everything, um, Minus the textbook is on there, but I will be adding that right after this. All right. Very cool. Well, it was fun. Thank you all for joining us today. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Jennifer, you said you want to try it before you on your own before you work with kids. Definitely. I always recommend that. Make <laughs> it yourself. Learn all the things you're not supposed to do, <laughs> like holding it at the top and having it fall. Um, awesome. Yay. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much, Aaron. Really appreciate you being a My guest pleasure. on our StarNet webinar series. And with that, um, I'm going to end the webinar. Have a great day, everybody. Bye-bye. Okay. Boy, James hung up on us quick, didn't he? <laughs>